all right so good evening friends good evening how are you how was how is everyone how is everyone i hope you had good session in the exams you had attempted orthodontic mcqs with full confidence and enthusiasm so here we are today to discuss about the questions which had come to you in the ini ct november 2023 examinations <clears throat> right so the first question which came in the exam was it was an image based question in which you have to identify the appliance given in the image so you have to identify this particular appliance so before that you need to understand what kind of appliance is this so it is a fixed functional appliance it is a fixed functional appliance for correction of class 2 malocclusion basically <clears throat> class 2 division 1 or division 2 that does not matter it basically is used to correct the skeletal class 2 malocclusion. So, we are supposed to identify what appliance is this. So, before that, you have to understand that it is made up of a telescopic spring mechanism, as you can see in this figure. In this figure, so it is composed of a telescopic spring mechanism on both sides, <coughs> here as well as here. So, it's a bilateral appliance, plus, it is attached to the molar. It is attached to the molar uh, crowns on the upper first molar and the lower and the lower first molar, right? So basically, according to this description, the appliance which is which the the, the appliance which is this is this is Herb's appliance, right? What about other options? <coughs> what is the Jasper jumper? You know this is a Herb's appliance. This figure is also of the Herb's appliance. <laughs> so. It has got a telescopic mechanism, as I said earlier, it has got a bilateral telescopic mechanism and it is attached to the upper molar crown and the lower in lower canine crown. And even sometimes it can even be it can even be connected to the lower premolar crowns in some cases. So this is the right lateral view. This is the left lateral view of the same appliance. Similarly, this is the frontal view of the of the same appliance. Right. So. <coughs> A brief description about Herb's appliance. It was first invented by a person called Emil Herbst. It was invented by a person called Emil Herbst. But his name got lost in the history. This appliance was not given due recognition as, as it deemed basically. So the appliance got lost. It was not used. It was not advocated for a very long period of time by the orthodontists in the community. He is a German. He is a German orthodontist. So later on, later on, it was popularized by was popularized by Hans Panchers in the 1970s. It was only after the reintroduction of this appliance, this appliance gained immense popularity in the orthodontic fraternity and it it and it became one of the mainstay appliances one of the main go to appliances to be used for correction of skeletal class 2 malocclusion specifically during the late developmental stages of the child's developmental age right so this is a this is a rigid fixed functional appliance so just remember that there are certain other classifications we have rigid we have flexible we have got semi flexible fixed functional appliances and we have discussed about these appliances in the recorded versions of the lectures so this is a rigid fixed functional appliance which does not allow much lateral movement of the mandible per se that is why it is called a rigid fixed functional appliance all right now what about other options in the in the question now the second option was jasper jumper for that you need to understand what jasper jumper is so the basic difference once you look at the plans once you look at the once you look at the image in the image based question the basic difference which should come into your mind is the architecture of that appliance right so jasper jumper it is composed of a nickel titanium spring austenitic nickel titanium super elastic coil spring this is night eye coil spring and over that over the spring as you can see in this figure over the spring a silicon coating is placed this is this comes pre-manufactured from the manufacturer it is 
marketed by many other companies i will not take the names of those companies right now in the lecture so just remember this comes in a prefabricated uh, condition with specific with specific distances now how that distance is measured now you have to you have to select which which length of the jasper jumper has to be used for correction of which appliance which malatuje in your case for that you need to take a ruler you have to take a ruler as you can see in this figure and you have to measure the distance between the mesial aspect of the upper first molar that means the molar tube of the upper first molar and the distal aspect of the bracket of the lower canine so this is the distance that needs to be considered for while selecting the length of that appliance this is the distance which needs to be considered and you have to add a little bit of uh, uh, you can say you can you have to add say 5 mm or 10 mm depending on the overjet if the overjet is around 3 mm you have to select 2 mm of the matlab i mean the this distance plus 2 mm if the overjet is around 10 mm you have to select at least 8 mm of the of the spring length so that's how you have to select what exact length of the jasper jumper plans will be used in your case similar is the situation in this case also in the case of forces fatigue resistant device also as i'll be discussing after a few slides this is the same mechanism of selecting the length of the plans which a plans that length which needs to be selected which needs to be put for correcting the intermaxillary skeletal class 2 malocclusion and as the name suggests it was invented by a person called jasper so this is how the plans looks like in the, in the patient's mouth this is a silicon covering over the nickel titanium super elastic coil spring so the use of this silicon covering is that it is biocompatible first of all and the most obvious reason is that it will not allow any uh you know uh, it it will not allow any accumulation of food particles and it will be much much more comfortable to the patient because you know these appliances are quite bulky in size they are very bulky so they have to be covered by a silicone coating so that no trauma occurs while patient performs the masticatory and other oral functions other masticatory and speech functions third option was reto appliance now what is a reto appliance it is a miniaturized telescopic device you know all these my uh, fixed functional appliances they have something in common all of them have telescopic mechanism basically they act on the principle of push mechanism we are pushing the mandible forward taking support from the maxillary molars so here in this case the anchorage is taken from the maxillary molars based on that the entire mandible is pushed forward so that's why they can be classified as a push type of appliance right so the basic underlying philo phys uh, philosophy behind working on these appliances is the use of telescopic mechanism is the same telescopic mechanism what you must have observed in in motorcycles in bikes that the shock absorber if you look at that uh, if you look at that assembly of shock absorbers in bike or in cars also for that matter so the same principle of shock absorbance is used it is utilized for these fixed functional plans also so this is how the reto plans looks like in the patient's mouth it is attached it is attached to the molar tube it is attached to the upper molar tube and it is uh, and it is on in the maxillary arch and it is attached distal to the distal to the uh, mandibular canine in case of the mandibular arch and this is how the plans looks like in the patient's mouth and the person who invented this was antonio corrodio reto so the plans is named after the person who invented it and he was an italian orthodontist okay talking about forces fatigue resistant device this again this again uh, works on the principle of telescopic me mechanism as i said so it pushes the mandible forward again this can be again be classified as a push type of an appliance and this is a semi rigid semi rigid or you can also say it is a hybrid type of a fixed functional appliance because it it allows it allows a lateral movement of the mandible up to certain extent okay so in this case also here also the forces fatigue resistant device it is attached to the headgear tube of the molar band 
this is the head gear tube of the molo band you can see you can see a a small attachment is getting inside the head gear tube and it is turned distally so that it does not come out right and the and the entire assembly is placed here and the and the lower end of the assembly is placed just distal to the just distal to the uh, canine bracket of the lower lower arch right so again it works on the same principle it pushes the mandible forward and the same principle has to be used for selecting the length of that spring as i explained in the as i explained earlier in the in the jasper jumper case this is how this is the same mechanism by which the length of that forces fatigue resistant device is is considered to be used in that patient okay now the next question is this is again an image based questions we have seen we have seen an trend of uh, incorporation of certain image based questions in the examinations since the last you can say since last 5 or 6 years i have observed that change in the trend so the question was the following appliance is made up of what metal so for that you need to identify what appliance is this so this appliance is a nitai expander so as the name suggests it is incorporated within the name of the appliance nitai so the most obvious answer will be it is made up of nickel titanium okay now a brief description about this appliance this appliance is called as nitai expander and it is it is most specifically used in cleft lip and palate patients this is a very effective appliance in causing expansion the skeletal expansion of the maxilla specifically you uh, indicated in cleft lip and palate patients so it was developed by a person called wendel v ant in the year 1993 and it is made up of nickel titanium plus some amount of copper also in that right so the force which can be utilized to cause expansion of the maxilla is around 180 to 300 grams and it comes in different sizes it comes from 26 to 44 mm depending on the intermolar width plus 3 mm here also it is prefabricated it is marketed by certain companies like omco american orthodontics etc so basically how to how to select which size of the appliance will be utilized in your patient in this case you have to you have to look for the intermolar width now how intermolar width is calculated it is calculated like this it is calculated it is calculated through the uh, through the ling uh, parietal aspect of the first molar the 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 groove the parietal groove of the first molar to the parietal groove of the contralateral first molar so that distance is measured using a caliper or a scale or any other device and you have to add plus 3 mm in that so this is the size of the appliance which you are going to select and which needs to be placed in the patient's mouth for causing proper expansion of the maxilla so a brief anatomy of the appliance so it is made up of 0.032 inch stainless steel wires these wire they are they are specifically for causing expansion of the of the premolar and and in and the canine segments then we have got stainless steel attachment for lingual tube here and we have got 0.035 thermal activated titanium on both sides so these are the copper nitai wires these are the copper nitai wires and it has got a transition temperature of 94 degree fahrenheit now why, what does 94 degree fahrenheit mean you know the, bod the normal body temperature the normal human body temperature is approximately 37.1 degree celsius right everybody knows that now on the conversion scale if you if you convert this 90 uh, if uh, 37.1 into fahrenheit it comes out to be approximately 98 degree fahrenheit right so that also you are aware of so this is the normal body temperature and your mouth is also not is is no is no exception so the entire body temperature the internal body temperature which is regulated by the thermostatic mechanism in the, in the hypothalamus the same temperature is going to be present in the mouth as well right so the meaning of transition temperature is that this is a specific characteristics of copper nitai wires 
so the copper basically the incorporation of copper in nitride wire is basically responsible for causing the temperature related temperature related conversion from martensitic to austenitic or austenitic to martensitic that is the basic difference between that so in in wires where the copper is not added there is a pure conversion from austenite to martensite during the deformation stage during the deformation of the wire right but once the copper is incorporated as it has been incorporated in this particular appliance the copper undergoes transition temperature changes it undergoes transition temperature changes and it causes conversion from austenite to martensite at just below the just below the normal body temperature which is present in the mouth as well so that helps in activation of the plants it can also be this 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 mechanism this this phenomena can also be utilized for uh, easy placement of the plants in the patient's mouth and then the plants is activated once the plants which is the body temperature and it's and it starts causing expansion because of transformation from martensite to austenite this is a reverse transformation which happens this is a reverse transformation which happens from martensite to austenite and through that the expansion of the maxilla takes starts to take place all right so this is about the image based question next question which of these wires can undergo maximum bends before fracture now the meaning of maximum bends that means the wire has to has to have good formability there is a physical characteristics called formability once you know what is formability what is formability and then you have to understand which of these wires can undergo maximum bends before fracture before fracture means before the failure of the metal Co options are cobalt chromium nickel titanium beta titanium and stainless steel wires so out of these out of these the wires which can undergo the wire which has got maximum formability is beta titanium and it is this property of the wire which is utilized in making loops in frictionless mechanics frictionless retraction mechanics okay so the correct answer for this question will be beta titanium a brief description about the stress strain curve and the concept of formability resilience and everything if you stretch a wire if you stretch a wire beyond its normal uh, length so the up to a certain limit the wire undergoes wire undergoes proportional changes in the in the in the strain that means the strain is rightly proportional to the stress what you apply to the wire so stress is uh, is plotted on the y axis strain is plotted on the x axis right up to a certain extent there is an elastic deformation that means if you if you remove the stress the wire is going to come back to its original configuration that is up to this point up to the point called proportional limit beyond that the plastic deformation starts beyond that plastic deformation starts up to a point which is known as yield strength this blue dot here this blue dot here is called the yield strength that means if you if you remove the stress the wire is going to come back to its original configuration with z approximately 0.01% strain still remaining and this strain which remains that is called the permanent deformation that is why it is called as plastic plastic deformation it is not going to correct on its own now after that if you if you stress the wire if you stretch the, or if you bend the wire even beyond the yield strength it is going to fracture at one point so this is that point which is known as which is known as failure point or fracture point the the wire is going to fracture beyond this point and the area of the graph area of the graph between yield strength and the fracture point is known as formability so 
by definition formability is a capability of a material to undergo plastic deformation to a given shape without being damaged or without being fractured here the metal is able to undergo a large amount of strain hardening so that is a clinical application of of materials having good formability right so this is what i was talking about so you are stressing a wire this is the proportional limit the yield point the point of arbitrary clinical loading and finally the failure point another uh, option is another uh, thing to understand here there are two concepts called range and spring back and stiffness right so stiffness is di is what is stiffness it is directly proportional to the modulus of elasticity of that material so it is not in our control spring back means if you stretch a wire up to this point up to this point it is going to come back to its original point having some permanent conformation strain changes so that is called spring back and range means range means from starting point to the yield point right and the and the area of the graph and the area of the graph up to proportional limit is known as resilience now what is resilience it's a relative amount of elastic energy per unit volume released on unloading of the test specimen okay so you have to understand the meaning of resilience the meaning of formability and how they are important from the standpoint of of clinical application of these orthodontic arch wires so based on this concept out of the four options beta titanium has for the maximum formability that means it can be bent into a number of shapes it can be bent into u loop omega loop t loop opus loop there are n number of loops uh, of use in orthodontics based on their uses based on the complexity and based on certain other mechanics which can be utilized for these loops so correct answer will be formability so i have given a small uh, brief description about comparison of characteristics of different orthodontic arch wires i was i was put a question across somebody put in question across to me that whether we need to remember the numerical values of these of these physical quali uh, physical characteristics or not actually bachcha you don't need to remember that that mathematical values all you need to remember is which material is is uh, is uh, like i mean to say which material has got maximum of what quality maximum of what characteristic or the minimum of what characteristic right so for stainless steel wire for stainless steel wire since you know stainless steel is very hard material it has got high stiffness right it can be soldered or welded and it has got low friction stainless steel has got high spring high stiffness and low friction number 1 cobalt chromium wire has got again it has got high stiffness it can be soldered and welded and it has got low to moderate amount of friction i'll i'll talk about that uh, friction also talk about nickel titanium it has got high spring back this is important nickel titanium as the name says it has got two unique characteristics to its name shape memory and super elasticity hence the spring back will be will be much more stiffness will be low because it is a springy material formability is quite poor for nickel titanium wires and it is not joinable this is again an mcq question which of the following uh, wires cannot be joined so nickel titanium wire cannot be joined so please remember that talking about beta titanium wire it has got average stiffness it has got good formability this formability is a maximum out of all these wires and it can only be welded not soldered and friction is very very high in case of beta titanium wires and talking about multi stranded wires we're talking about multi stranded wires it has got it has got uh, poor formability and it can be soldered and welded also so talking about friction talking about friction stainless steel has got the least friction followed by cobalt chromium wire followed by nickel titanium wire followed by beta titanium wire this is the sequence of friction all right so please remember this is the sequence of friction 
this is again an mcq based question application based mcq for you people next question again in image based question you have to identify the plans options are it's a fixed appliance for thumb sucking whether it's a removable appliance for thumb sucking whether it's a fixed appliance for lip biting or removable appliance for tongue thrusting habit so before that you have to you have to decide for yourself what kind of appliance is this this is a habit breaking appliance as you can clearly see in the image this is a habit breaking appliance now habit breaking appliances are of two categories one is removable one is fixed removable means the 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 habit breaking appliance the the rakes or the crips are incorporated within the holy sacralic plate which can easily be removed from the patient by the patient but in this case you can very well see the presence of molar bands cemented onto the molars so it is a fixed appliance it is a fixed habit breaking appliance now you know you have to look at the un, uh, options available so is it a f uh, if it, you know it is a fixed appliance so you can eliminate these two options so it is a fixed appliance for thumb sucking or it's a fixed appliance for lip biting for lip biting we don't use this appliance we don't use we don't use parietal crib appliance we use some appliance known as lip bumper so this can be fixed as a, as well as it can be removable also so this is the correct option for this it's a fixed habit breaking appliance for thumb sucking habit having parietal rakes okay now what are the other methods of correcting of uh, of ha of uh, thumb sucking habit this is another appliance it can be given with, uh, along with the main arch y along with the main along with the uh, orthodontic treatment which is happening simultaneously you can see this these are the molar bands cemented onto the molars and this is the appliance this is a fixed appliance this is a parietal crib appliance which is fixed onto these molars it's a parietal crib appliance which is fixed onto the molar so it is also a f it's, it's also a fixed habit breaking appliance for correction of tongue thrusting habit as well as for uh, digit sucking habit also so this is another example of the same another appliance which gained popularity in the recent times is known as blue grass appliance it was given by haskell and mink they were the two people who developed this appliance in the first place so what is it how is it different from the other appliances as we discussed earlier so it is also a fixed appliance the molar bands are cemented onto the molars it has got it has got a parietal bar like uh, uh, it has got a parietal bar with a acrylic roller with an acrylic roller that means the patient can move the tongue along it the the tongue can be used to roll the uh, roll the roller over the wire so this can be utilized this can be utilized as a as a reminder therapy right so this is going to help patient elevate from the habit of tongue thrusting habit as well as from the digit sucking habit also next question pretty simple one the orange colored line in the graph below shows growth of which tissue now you know this is scammon's growth curve very characteristics is scammon's growth curve right now scammon had described four tissues basically in the body and he had described the the growth pattern of those four tissues so according to this to this diagram the blue graph is for lymphoid system the the uh, uh, magenta graph is for genital tissues the green graph is for central nervous system and head and the orange graph is for general body structures right so according to the answer according to the options provided it shows the growth of general body tissues okay now just for your reference i have incorporated a figure showing the same so this is called this is the lymphoid system how is it characteristic the lymphoid system is responsible for maintaining the immunity in the child 
as you know the children are very naughty they uh, pick up everything from the floor and they put directly inside the mouth so the nature has given a compensation protective mechanism to those children so that the immunity has to be kept at a very high level so that the children do not f- do not fall ill very frequently so what happens the lymphoid system it grows up to 200% size of the adult size by the time the child is around 11 to 12 years of age yeah, or you can say it between 10 to 12 years of age and later on it the 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 hypertrophied lymphoid system it involutes to come back to the original 100% size by the time the child attains uh, the end of puberty right so that is characteristic phenomena of lymphoid system what about brain and head that means the central nervous system and the head now you know the brain and the head uh, uh, it completes its 90% growth by the time the child is around 5 to 6 years of age i hope you know that so you can correlate with the same in the graph by the time the child is around 6 years of age you can observe that around 90% of the of the growth of the central nervous system and of the head as a whole has been completed the reproductive system are of no use till the time reach uh, till the time the child reaches uh, adulthood and puberty so the reproductive system both in males and females along with other sexual characteristics they start to appear rather they start to gain uh, increase in volume and of course the function of the function also by the time the child is 14 years plus that means you can correlate by the time the puberty sets in the puberty dawns only at that time the reproductive organ the, re- the reproductive system of both males and females start to develop functionally and anatomically as well and reaches up to the adult size by the time the child is 18 to 20 years of age and if you take a if you combine all these four uh, structures together we find a s shaped sigmoid shaped curve of the general body tissues so as you can see here this is a graph the black graph is an s shaped sigmoid curve which is characteristic of general body tissues in the in the in the jaws in the skeletal uh, structures if you if you uh, differentiate between the maxilla and the mandible you will observe that the maxilla grows little earlier as compared to the mandible according to the cephalocaudal gradient of growth now what is that the cephalocaudal gradient of growth says the structures away from the base of the brain base of the head base of the skull or you can say they grow at a faster rate as compared to the structures proximal to it so in the craniofacial skeleton the mandible is away from the base of the skull as compared to the maxilla that's why the maxilla completes its growth at a early stage <coughs> but the mandible catches up later on ultimately both jaws are going to grow both jaws are going to come at a normal level in, in the in the anteroposterior sagittal plane but the rate of growth of maxilla is more than the rate of growth of the mandible and the mandible catches up to that of the maxilla by a phenomena known as catch up growth that is why you will see you will observe a small difference between the graphs of the maxilla and the mandible and here you can see the ultimate the end result the ultimate end result is that both jaws have reached the have reached the same size by the time the child has reached up to 20 years of age okay next question this is again a simple question hyperactive mentalis is a feature of which of these malocclusions now hyperactive mentalis what is mentalis it's a muscle overlying the chin so it is a characteristic feature of class 2 division 1 malocclusion now what is hyperactive mentalis before that we need to understand what is class 2 division 1 malocclusion class 2 what is class 2 Here the distal para- distal buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar, the distal max distal pa- par- distal buccal sorry cusp of the maxillary first molar, it lies along the buccal groove of the mandibular first molar. That is class two. Class two division one, as you can see in this figure, we have extremely proclined upper anteriors with deep bite and a very large overjet plus. plus you can also see in some cases you can see a presence of cover bite also so that is class 2 division 1 malocclusion what are other clinical features of that as you can see here the upper teeth 
the maxillary teeth are too much flared forwards you can see this you can see the long axis of the upper anterior is too much way forward and because of that overjet the lower lip gets trapped between the parietal surface of the upper anterior and the facial surface of the lower anterior so this is known as lip trap mechanism and you can also see a deep mentolabial sulcus it's quite deep here okay for that also there is something called hyperactive mentalis hyperactive mentalis because of the because of the deep mentolabial sulcus the mentalis muscle gets activated and it gives an appearance called golf ball appearance as you can see in this figure this is a golf ball i have put a figure for your reference and another clinical appearance of the same is known as is known as puckering of the chin right just try to do it yourself just activate the mentalis muscle on your chin and then try to feel it or you can you can see yourself in the mirror also you will observe the skin over the chin has has small small depressions here and there so that is very much similar to the golf ball appearance that is why this this phenomena is known as puckering of the chin or golf ball appearance okay so it is a characteristic feature of class 2 division 1 malocclusion next mcq again an image based question you have to identify which appliance is this so it's a removable functional appliance it's a removable functional appliance if you look at this appliance very closely you will observe the presence of a palatal omega shape loop arch wire along with the vestibular wires so this architecture of of this architecture is very characteristic of which appliance it is characteristic of bionator appliance so bionator was first given by balter this was a person who was advocated the use of bionator in the myofascial orthodontics so activator it's not an activator it's also known as monoblock it has got it has got no other wire component except a labial bow and it is it is quite a bulky appliance and it was given by andreasen it's given by andreasen also known as norwegian appliance and bionator the parent of the bionator was the activator that means the bionator has been developed from the activator itself but the bulk of the appliance has been reduced significantly right so by the other name of bionator is also known as cut out activator also known as skeletonized activator okay now what about twin block twin block was given by william clark in 1977 in scotland it has got two appliances one block is is worn on the maxilla and another uh, another block is worn on the mandible so you can see in the figure it does not have two block so you can very well straight forwardly eliminate this option what about frankel frankel is a very complex uh, appliance it was given by rolf frankel i hope you know that so we can eliminate that also so it is a sh it is a very simple question it is this appliance is basically called bionator now what are the parts of bionator this it has got acrylic part it has got vestibular arch that is a labial portion and the parietal arch that omega shape parietal arch what i just talked about and it has got buccinator loop so it uh, it works on the principle of force elimination the buccinator loops they keep the uh, they keep the teeth away from the inwardly directed forces from the buccal musculature hence it works on the principle of force elimination and once you have taken the bite in a in a forward forwardly protruded mandibular position that is the bite jumping so it works on the principle of force application you are you are applying the force on the mandible to keep it in a forward position okay 
what are different types of bioinators one is standard appliance one is screening appliance one is reverse appliance okay this is again the same figure showing the wire components so it has got a parietal bar it has this is the parietal bar and it has got a vestibular vestibular part of the labial bone so the importance of this parietal bar a small description about the philosophy of the working of this appliance so balters was of the opinion that the parietal bar is quite important why because it maintains the position of the tongue and it's a tongue only that plays a very significant role in the development of class 2 malocclusion so if you correct the position of the tongue the class 2 malocclusion is going to be corrected so the appliance design was such a way that this appliance this particular part of the appliance that is a parietal bar it can be used to keep the tongue in a forward position so once the tongue is kept in a forward position it is going to cause movement of the mandible forward in a subconscious way so ultimately leading to condylar glenoid fossa changes here and ultimately remounting leads to correction of class uh, class 2 from uh, correction of class 2 malocclusion next mcq what type of nasolabial angle is present in this case so again in image based question let's zoom in so this is the nasolabial angle here basically now what is nasolabial angle for that you have to understand it's a soft tissue parameter basically during the uh, very lately during recent times the importance of soft tissue has gained immense popularity in the treatment planning of orthodontic procedures so previously there were certain advocate certain uh, ad, uh, proponents of of non extraction therapy as well as extraction therapy also right so the nasolabial angle basically it forms a mainstay of decision making framework during the treatment planning procedure so if you see that the upper teeth are extremely proclined or you can also say in a way that the soft tissue profile of the patient looks very strained you have to go for other investigative mechanisms other investigation you have to look for the lip strain you have to look for the uh, uh, action inclination of the upper anteriors based on that you have to go, you have to form whether the extraction will be required in the patient or not so for that there has been a paradigm shift for that this nasolabial angle is plays a very important role right so it is formed by drawing a line tangent to the base of the nose and a line tangent to the upper lip so this is what nasolabial angle is and you have to measure this particular angle here if it is the ideal value is 102 plus minus 8 degrees this is a no, is ideal value in normal case scenario any deviation from this value warrants attention and as i said any deviation from this value can be if if the value is if the value is more than 102 degrees that means uh, that means the nasolabial angle is very obtuse if it is more than 102 degrees it means it is obtuse that means the soft tissue profile is very much favorable for non extraction therapy and if it is less than 102 degrees it is acute which shows that the upper lips are quite strained and in most of the cases i'm not saying this is the only criteria we have to go for other investigations also other parameters also then you have to decide whether extraction will be required or not you have to also go for model analysis also so in most cases where uh, the nasolabial angle is acute the most likely treatment protocol will be following of extraction protocol okay so this is what nasolabial angle is so coming back to the figure as you can see it is quite less than 90 degree here as i can see in the figure it seems to be less than 90 degree so it is quite acute in size right so that was about today's session hope you have gained something out of this session if you have got any doubts you are very much free to ask us anywhere on facebook as well as on telegram you know where to find me and i'll be very happy to help you guys
感じぐらい。